Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stephon Never Told You, production of iHeartRadio. And welcome once again to our once a month Sminty Fiction segment, which is ongoing. Uh, Terminus, which is a story I wrote in 2010 for NaNoWriMo. And we're just going to go through it. We're just going through it. Uh, This is chapter 8.2. Again, as I said in the previous episode, I think it might actually be chapter 7, but something went awry. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, We're in part two of chapter eight, which was a longer chapter. As always, thanks to our super producer, Christina, who makes these possible. If this is not your thing, I totally understand, especially right now, because it is kind of dark. So I'll give you a quick uh, recap of what's happened. We've got a virus that is wiping out the human population Um, it's making it difficult for people to have children. Um, So humanity is just dying off. Uh, Any child that is born is placed under the jurisdiction of the Board of Better Parenting. Um, And there's this really religious organization called ARM, A-R-M, that works with the government and they're in control of all these things. Our main character, Tilda, has escaped with her illegally born child, Madison. It's been seven years. They're on the run. The enforcers are after them. Things aren't looking good. They get captured. Tilda gets shot. They make a daring escape. And then they are rescued by this woman named Lynn, who has lost a child of her own. And um, it's nice. They get to, like, have pancakes and be in a house and there's water and they take showers and they sleep in beds and it's really nice. But Tilda realizes the enforcers are not going to stop looking for them because they are priority number one case. And uh, she makes the difficult decision to leave. And Lynn has told her about this fabled resistance in Kansas City uh, that is perhaps looking for a cure for HSV-5, and Tilda decides to try to find it with very vague instructions. So, once again, this was written before I played The Last of Us, okay? (laughs) Don't come at me. (laughs) I I was telling Samantha, if you look at a map, it makes sense. When you're traveling across the country, you would go (laughs) that way. Um, So, (laughs) (laughs) um, content warning around uh, depression, sadness, uh, discussions of loss of a child, um, stigma around sex, internalized ableism around disease. Uh, Yeah, totally hear you if this is not for you right now. Also, don't yell at me if I got the roads incorrect, okay? (laughs) I did spend an embarrassing amount of time looking at a map and trying to figure it out, but I just... Just go with it, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Willing suspension of disbelief. Yes, thank you. So with that note, let us get into the fiction section. Tilda left the kitchen and entered the sitting room to find Madison on his stomach on the carpet, legs scissoring as he perused what, judging by its larger size and heft, Tilda guessed to be a textbook. Social studies, Lynn had mouthed to her. He looked up at her, a sunny smile breaking out on his face, his skin unmarked by the virus like a time bomb in his blood, waiting patiently to detonate. Sinking down next to him on the carpet, Tilda queried, What are you reading about? Madison wrinkled his nose, enunciating each syllable clearly, citizenship and civic responsibility. His response had an unsure lilt to it, despite his careful and correct pronunciation. Tilda imagined he'd heard those words before in different contexts and had a basic sketch of their dictionary meaning, but no concept of what they really meant. Those things meant very little to anyone anymore, especially considering the life they spent trying to keep away from others and evade the state. Did there really used to be hol... He looked down at the book for guidance. Holidays. Tilda glanced down at the illustrations, colorful pictures of cornucopias and jack-o'-lanterns and decorated evergreens crammed into the bottom corner of the page. Yeah, she murmured. Madison swung his eyes up to meet hers, curiosity alight in them. Did you celebrate them with your family when you were a kid? 
Tilda situated herself so she lay on her stomach next to Madison, her fist propping up her chin. I did, sort of. My mother used to cook some of the traditional foods, read me stories. If she could find music, she'd play it. She trailed off, reminiscing. Holidays had been fading away for a while by the time Tilda was introduced to them. There were no days off, no decorations, just small family celebrations by those that remembered and cared, usually those lucky enough to have children. Wow. Tilda gave Madison a thoughtful look, smiling a little at his amazement. Maybe we'll have one of our own little holidays someday, when we find somewhere. Madison craned his neck, frowning. We have found somewhere, haven't we? Dread unfurling in her gut, Tilda took hold of his tiny hand, such a small hand, and gentled her voice. No, Mouse, we can't stay here. His face fell, hazel eyes glistening. Why not? Why can't we stay? She sighed, hating this. The enforcers know we're somewhere around here. They'll find us eventually. But we could hide, Madison pushed himself to his knees. Tilda did the same. And they'd leave. An attractive possibility, but in Tilda's view, an unlikely one. They were relentless. We can't. They won't stop. Lynn has done enough for us. We can't put her in danger any longer. Madison's lip trembled, his eyes glassy and wide. I'm sorry, Tilda whispered. I know you want to stay. I do too. But we have to leave. Tonight. Tonight? Madison repeated, tears escaping and spilling down his pale cheeks. Yes. We're going to pack a few things, get some warmer clothes, and leave when it gets dark. Madison sniffled, wiping his face with the back of his hand. But what about your leg? I'll be fine, she assured him. But we'll have to be very careful. They'll be looking for us. Overcome, Madison covered his face with his hands, shoulders quaking. Tilda scooted closer, looping her arm around his shoulders and pulling him to her. I don't want to leave. <laughs> he sobbed, his words mangled. I know. Tilda soothed this air. Please. Tilda didn't, couldn't respond to that. After a while, when his crying subsided, Tilda told him, Lynn says there's a place, there might be a place, she amended. But people like us, hiding from enforcers, close to here. That's where we're going. Okay? Madison showed no sign of hearing her for a moment, but then he nodded minutely against her chest. She sighed, almost disappointed, like she'd wanted him to talk her out of it, to give her a reason to stay. Her hand wove in his brown hair, soft with washing, and she kissed his forehead. You're so brave, you know that? No, I'm not. He denied petulantly, muffled by where his head was buried into Tilda's shoulder. She laughed. Yes, you are. They sat in silence for a long moment, both dreading the night that lay before them. You should take a nap, Tilda informed him softly, but he resisted. No, it's my last day here. I don't want to spend it sleeping. You need to get some rest before tonight, she said reasonably, but she didn't have it in her to make him. I'll rest while I read, he promised earnestly, the vestiges of sadness starting to disappear. Caving, Tilda let him return to his book, laughing at the exaggerated concentration he directed at it. Ruffling his hair affectionately, Tilda stood. Cobwebs of exhaustion crowded her own mind, but she fought them off, heading down the hall to check on Lynn. She stopped at the doorway, watching. Lynn was sorting through clothes, methodical, neatly folding the items that passed inspection and placing them in a mid-sized black backpack. She startled, catching sight of Tilda at the door. Embarrassed, Tilda asked, Can I help you with anything? No, dear, Lynn said firmly. Why don't you lie down for a bit? Or you might want to try some stretches for your leg. I'll get you when it's time for lunch, and then we'll take a look at the map to figure out your best route. Tilda paused for a moment before nodding in assent, heading to the room she'd been sleeping in and set about stretching her leg. She found her dexterity to be slightly hindered, only a few winces making it to her face. Her muscles relaxed and she yawned, reclining to lay back on the floor. Her eyes fluttered closed, her chest raising and falling evenly. Colors swirled and faded in front of her eyes. Lynn's gentle voice snapped her out of her doze. Couldn't have made it to bed, hmm? She teased, offering her hand up to help Tilda to her feet. Tilda shook the numbness from her limbs, stumbling after the woman who had found them and brought them into her home, another wide yawn stretching over her face. 
<laughs> Laughter broke through the haze of half sleep, rendering Tilda's thoughts slow and useless. Lynn stood at the entrance to the sitting room, muffling her chuckles with a hand covering her lips. Tilda caught up to her, following her gaze. Madison had fallen asleep, with his face pressed into the pages of the book, legs and arms splayed. He snored quietly, face smooth of worry and sleep. Like his mother, he is, Lynn cordled, kneeling next to him and gently grasping his shoulder, shaking him to wake him. Madison jerked awake. He looked up, blinking owlishly, cheek creased and hair must. I fell asleep. He slurred, rubbing his eyes. Yes, you did, Lynn agreed good-naturedly. Now it's time for lunch. Are you hungry? Madison blinked a few more times, face blank. Then he nodded, getting to his feet clumsily. A plate of toast, boiled eggs, and salad awaited them, glasses of water and silverware already set. The meal was noticeably more subdued, all three preoccupied with the coming goodbye, the knowledge that they most likely would never see each other again, casting a pall over them. Madison only ate half of his plate before he pushed it away, hands in his lap, and hiccuping softly. Lynn cooed in endearment, abandoning her own food to wrap her arms around the thin boy, murmuring into his ear and rubbing his back. The contents in Tilda's stomach curdled as she watched them, helpless, a stranger intruding on something private. Lynn started to sing softly, rocking Madison. Tilda couldn't remember the last time she'd done that for him. She watched a stone, something eroding inside her, The need to apologize overwhelmed her, but she couldn't make herself speak. Lynn finished her song, Madison's crying turning into tiny sniffles. The woman eased the boy back so she could look into his eyes. It'll be all right, dear. You'll see. You just have to be brave and do what your mother says. Her smile wavered but held, and Madison nodded dutifully. Good boy, she praised. Now hop down and go rest up. I'm going to pack some rations for you and your mom. Listlessly, Madison slipped from the woman's lap and disappeared into the setting room. Lynn cleared the table, bending their uneaten food. To Tilda, she said, I have some granola bars, fruit, almonds. She rifled around her cupboards. Not much else that will travel well, I'm afraid. Water, of course. Tilda swallowed, breaking herself free of the numbness. It's plenty, she assured Lynn, her voice delicate. Thank you. She knew the simple phrase could not convey all the sincerity she felt nor encompass all Lynn had done and was doing for them. If not for you, I might have died. And Madison, it did not bear thinking about. She closed her eyes, banishing what might have been from her mind. Thank you. Lynn started to brush off the apology as unneeded, but drew up short at the expression on Tilda's face. They held each other's gaze for a long moment, the woman deprived of her child and the lost mother. Lynn nodded, accepting her gratitude. Lynn abruptly turned and busied herself stacking items on the counter. She faltered with the bottles of water, knocking one to its side. She took a deep breath and pressed her palms into the countertop. Tilda watched impassively. You take care of that child. Lynn's voice shook with the depth of her emotion, but otherwise was quite firm, commanding even. It goes against everything I have to let you both go. You promise me that I won't regret it. Promise me you will put him above everything else. Behind the glasses, her eyes glinted, fixed on Tilda, looking for any sign of weakness, any reason to keep her from taking Madison and leaving. I promise, Tilda said, unyielding. I am nothing without him. Lynn nodded curtly. Good. She strode past Tilda and down the hall, returning with the backpack she'd been folding clothes into earlier and began to fill it with the assortment of snacks she'd put together. Briskly, she said, I've set aside some warmer clothes for you both to put on before you leave. The sizes might be a bit on the large side, but I won't have you out gallivanting in the cold with the rags that you showed up in. Tilda smirked at that. Once the last of the rations were packed away, Lynn went over to a set of drawers next to the door, fishing around until she located a map. She unfolded it and spread it out on the kitchen table, smoothing it with her hands. They both leaned over the square where Topeka lay, tracing the crisscrossing blue and red lines to Kansas City. The quickest route is to take I-40, Lynn said authoritatively, but is also the most likely to have enforcers patrolling it. Unfortunately, I don't think you have much of a choice. There aren't much in the way of roads out there, or at least not ones that don't dead end or turn into dirt roads in the middle of nowhere. She glanced up to see if Tilda disagreed, but Tilda concurred. It'll be easier to follow, definitely. With a nod, Lynn continued, Now, to get there, you take 6th Avenue East up until you get to I-70. Exit East, and from there, it's a straight shot to Kansas City, about 60 miles. Sounds simple enough, 
Hilda said, a little wary, leaning over the map, doing a quick catalog of the cities they'd cross through in case they needed to replenish supplies, the number of bridges, the number of rivers. Lynn snorted, readjusting her glasses. Tilda hunched forward, trying to memorize the mess of lines and symbols, but knowing that it wouldn't matter out there, cold and hungry and hunted. When it didn't look like a map, but an unending river of gray, blurring with the sky at the horizon. Where do we go once we get to Kansas City? Lynn shook her head. I don't know. Any decent resistance wouldn't advertise its existence. If the enforcers couldn't find it, what hope did she have? Like I said, Dan mentioned the Liberty Memorial, but I don't know. Where is that? Tilda asked, figuring it was worth knowing. Lynn hunched over the map, muttering under her breath. Ah, she jabbed the map with her finger. Here, to the south. Take I-35 down until you get to the Broadway exit. After that, there should be signs. Maybe you'll see it. I have no idea how big it is. Tilda nodded, running her hand through her hair. It was something. She'd just have to hope there'd be some sign that this resistance existed in the first place. A lot of this plan relied on hope. I'll give this to you, Lynn decided, folding up the map and slipping it into one of the pack's pockets. She sighed at a loss now that there was nothing to do but wait. She wrung her hands together, staring out the window. Tilda gave Lynn's shoulder a short squeeze, going to check on Madison. She found him curled up on the floor, staring ahead despondently. She knelt down beside him, stroking his hair. He didn't acknowledge her presence, but at the very least, it made her feel better. There was nothing to say. Tilda deigned not to tell Madison about the possibility of a cure. Somehow explaining it to him would make it seem more like a pipe dream. And if it turned out not to be true, at least he wouldn't have had his hopes crushed. And maybe a small part of her still wanted Madison to think she knew what she was doing. As her thoughts meandered, she pondered the possibility that this was an elaborate trap, a rumor set up by the enforcers to lure stragglers with the hope of a haven and ensnare them. They would have to exercise a level of caution beyond their norm and hope that this resistance existed. They'd also have to be careful not to lead the enforcers to this resistance, given that she and Madison could find it. A soft pattern gradually caught her attention. It was raining. Tilda sighed to herself. Lynn entered the room, her face grim. Let me check your bandages one last time. Grateful for the distraction from increasingly dark thoughts, Tilda stretched her leg out on the carpet, turning her knee in to give Lynn better access to the wound. The woman knelt next to her, casting a worried glance to Madison, who had yet to move. Gently, she pulled back the bandages on Tilda's calf, revealing a jagged pale pink cut about the size of her index finger, the ends of black stitches evenly spaced across it. Lynn examined it, tutting in approval. It's on the mend. I would recommend that you stay off it, but under the circumstances, well, just do the best you can. The stitches should dissolve by themselves in a few more days. Madison turned slowly and propped himself up then to get a look at the injury. Does it hurt at all? Lynn's professional voice conveyed her past as a doctor. Madison leaned in closer, his face pale. No. At the skeptical look on Lynn's face, she rushed to assert, It doesn't, just twinges a bit if I move it too fast or put too much weight on it. Lynn reminded her of her mother just then, able to make her see the flaws in her own argument without a word. The woman sighed, rewrapping her leg, telling Tilda that keeping it covered was more of a precaution now, but to do her best to keep it clean and not do any acrobatics. To Madison, she said in a mock stern voice, you watch her and make sure she doesn't do anything silly, right, Madison? Instead of the smile Lynn had hoped to coax from him, Madison nodded seriously, his gaze still transfixed on the now-covered wound. Lynn continued valiantly, the falter in her tone hardly noticeable. I packed a first aid kit and some basic medicines in your bag, just in case anything comes up. How'd you fit everything in there? Am I going to be able to lift it? Tilda teased, grinning when Lynn swatted at her. Madison, however, would not be dissuaded from his dark mood. What will I do if you get hurt again? He roughened his voice to hide his fear, but both the women could easily detect it. His voice tightened and he continued, what if you die, what will I do then? He was blinking far too much, the anxiety and plaintive note making him sound younger. He had never asked this question before. On their long journey, they had both sustained their fair share of injuries and illness, but nothing serious enough for Madison to believe that Tilda's life might be in danger. 
Many times, Tilda had feared for Madison's, which most likely was a combination of knowing the risk and understanding the concept of death, mixed with the fact that Tilda didn't know what illnesses looked like in children and had no one to ask about it. It had probably never occurred to him, or at least not in a manner that caused him to entertain it as a serious possibility. The possibility of Tilda's death had probably never really occurred to Madison. But now, well, she imagined she had looked pretty horrific stumbling down the road outside Lynn's house, blood running down her leg, not talking or even listening to the child, reduced to crawling until she finally collapsed. Clearing her throat, she said, I won't. How do you know? Madison demanded angrily. She could have lied, but she didn't. I promise I will do everything I can to never leave you. That appeased him somewhat, but he pushed. But what if you do? Trying and failing to keep her answer even, Tilda responded, You go with the enforcers. Madison's mouth fell open, his face one of utter betrayal. Lynn looked shocked. Listen to me, Tilda instructed, taking hold of his upper arms. It's not safe for you to be out in the wilderness alone. She almost fumbled at the word wilderness, but wasn't that what it was now? Buildings are not. It was a dangerous and abandoned world in which they roamed. The enforcers won't hurt you. I'd rather you be alive with them than alone and dead. Madison stared at her, unmoving. But they want to take me away from you. Gaining momentum, he expanded. They shot you. I won't be there, she reminded him quietly. It's me they want to hurt, not you. Why? Because you are a child. I am the one that broke the law. You have done nothing wrong. Petulantly, he argued, I've helped you. It doesn't matter. You're a child. You didn't know any better, she added mentally. But he struggled for words, his young mind grappling with concepts that most adults couldn't come to terms with. You were a child once. That brought a tiny smile to Tilda's lips. I'm not anymore. I can't go with them, he insisted. Yes, you can, Tilda told him firmly. All of this is to stay away from them, he cried, confused. Everything. I know. He crossed his arms. Then why don't we just stay here or let them catch us if I'm supposed to go with them anyway if you're not around? Because I am around, Tilda said patiently, and I don't plan on going anywhere. I don't understand, he admitted with a shadow of shame. They'll hurt me. They didn't care that I was sick. They were stopping to get you medicine, Tilda said in a rough whisper. But they didn't care, he lowered his voice. They didn't care that I need you. Tilda had no comeback for that. She couldn't find words to make him understand, and worse, she wasn't sure she wanted to. Was life more important than happiness? The mere question had her stomach churning. It was, of course. There could be no happiness without life. Madison's inability to grasp this was her own fault. She had spent their entire lives keeping him from the enforcers. In a reductive way, it was one of the main tenets of his life, a truth he'd learned and lived by, a constant and one of the few. Hazel eyes stared at her, searchingly, as if right through her. I'll die, he said simply, factually, and his words cut right through her. I'll die without you. The fight to maintain composure was one Tilda was losing. Behind Madison, Lynn covered her mouth with her hands. Swallowing thickly and taking several steadying breaths, Tilda said, You can't think like that. But it's true. Tilda sighed, rallying. It's not. You think like that now, but you're stronger than you know. Madison looked away, tired of the emotional conversation. Just don't die, okay? With a shaky laugh, Tilda promised, I'll do my best. She reached out, cupping his cheek, bending forward to place a kiss on his forehead. The rain continued to fall, rivulets streaming down the glass pane window, and darkness encroached, arriving quicker due to the clouds obscuring the sky. Lynn spoke up from behind them. Madison, you are more important than you know, to all of us. You need to do as your mother says and stay safe above all else. Are there more people like you out there? He asked, turning to her. Yes, Lynn murmured, but we are spread far out these days. Maybe I could find you again, he said, hopeful and tearful. Tilda's heart clenched. 
with a sad smile and said, I would like that very much, but don't try to find me if it puts you in danger. Chin wobbling, Madison nodded. Good. Lynn patted his head. Now, she stood, knees popping. Would you like to pick out a book to take with you? Rubbing his eyes, Madison crawled over to the bookshelf, tracing his finger along the spines. After some deliberation, he pulled out a medium-sized book. He held it up to Lynn, who took it from him with a warm grin. I'll just pack this up for you. All right, dear? Okay, he said. Lynn left, and the waiting recommenced. Madison pulled another book off the shelf and approached Tilda tentatively. Will you read to me? Of course. Tilda took the book and Madison curled up next to her. The book opened with a crack, pages yellowing, and she started to read, both of them savoring this moment, this small oasis of normalcy, of safety, before all too soon they were tossed back to a sea of danger and the unknown. And that brings us to the end of this part two of chapter eight of Terminus. Um, since it was a longer chapter, I don't really want to uh, go into things too much. Um, I did want to say that, you know, there's kind of the themes throughout of like doing anything for your child. There's the line, I'm nothing without him, which I was just telling Samantha it's kind of Something in me was like, this This game, The Last of Us, is going to come out later and they're going to have the same lines. Um, it's going to really change things. It's going to really <laughs> be there for you. Mm-hmm. And also just like a lot of examples of trauma in this chapter. This was a very kind of reflective chapter on trauma and Madison being dependent on Tilda. Madison being like, oh, I'm, I, what would I do if I lost you? And Tilda already showing that behavior. So uh, we shall see where it goes in the next chapter. But in the meantime, um, thanks as always for coming along this journey with us. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Uh, If you would like to find us, you can. Uh, You can email us at stephaniebombstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at Podcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff I Never Told You or on YouTube. Mm. Mm. Um, Yes. Thanks as always to Super Producer Christina who makes these happen. Yes. Amazing. Yes. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 